Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest Dodge Data and Analytics webinar. Um, uh, my name is Donna Laquadera Carr, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the latest smart market report we have on risk management in the construction industry. Before I dive in, though, I did want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as we proceed, um, I will be happy to take questions at the end, but you can certainly, you certainly don't have to hold questions to the end. Please feel free to type them in at any point. And to submit a question, please type them in the Ask a Question text field at the bottom left side of your screen and click Submit at any point during the webcast. If you lose audio at any time, please refresh your player by clicking the double circle arrows located near your volume slider. If you miss any portion of the live webcast, this event will be available on demand at the same link that you accessed it today. So with that said, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, as I said, mentioned already, my name is Donna Laquadera Carr. I have uh, been with Dodge for over 25 years and have over 25 years experience in construction news data and analysis. I've spent the last seven years as the managing editor of this Smart Market Report series. And we'll talk a little bit more about what those involve in a second. But first, I'm assuming everyone on the call is familiar with Dodge Data and Analytics. But just in case we are new to anyone, um, of course what we're most famous for is our Dodge Global Network with its expansive list of construction projects in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, many of you may also know us from our Suites.com app, which is the leading source of information about building products. The division I'm in, though, is the um, Dodge Analytics Market Research and Intelligence Division. We do provide off-the-shelf and custom analytics, and I am involved in the Smart Market Report series, which, takes, which does research on trends in the construction industry for publication. And you can see here is a, a series of a bunch of our smart market reports. We've actually done over 50 at this point. Uh, they tend to fall into three large buckets. Um, we have a whole, a whole series of reports that we've been doing since 2006 on sustainability, really have tracked the growth of that movement from its early stages. And our latest report in that area is our the report on the drive toward healthier buildings that we just brought out in the fall. Um, in addition, we have a um, technology and innovation focus as well. We have a very large series of reports that look at building information modeling, and I'll be touching on building information modeling a little bit in this presentation. But in addition to that, um, you know, we've looked at things like information mobility as well. And we've done a lot of work on practices and processes. Everything from our managing uncertainty report, which again I'll be touching on briefly in this report, in this discussion, to our safety report, to lean. And the key point I want to make here, well there's two key points I want to make here. First is that all of these reports are available for free download at the website that you see on the screen, analyticsstore.construction.com. They are all free, all available. If there's any topics here you, that you think are interesting, please be sure to visit that site and download the reports. But in addition to that, um, I did want to make the point that while we do have these separated out as three buckets for the purposes of presenting this, um, in fact, we find that these three topics are deeply interrelated, that uh, sustainability has helped drive changes in practices and processes, that technology also has supported some of those changes, um, and that you know, really that the practices and processes are often, the changes there are often the benefits that really carry the most weight in the construction industry. So today I'm going to focus on our latest study, which is managing risk in the construction industry. But as I mentioned already, I am going to be sharing findings from a couple of related studies that build upon this one. Now this study was possible due to the funding of our partners, um, in particular Alliant, who was our premier partner in this study. Um, but, and we, in addition, we had a wide range of participa participation by industry organizations, by the research partners you see listed below. Uh, they include a, really, uh, include a really wide assortment of organizations, from owner organizations to contractor and trade contractor organizations to ones that are specifically focused on risk. 
And um, this led us to have an extremely robust sample, 507 participants in the overall study, including uh, 111 owners, 253 GCs. And by GCs, I mean any kind of prime contractor. Um, it includes general contractors, of course, but also construction managers and design builders, and 143 trade contractors. So we really are very excited to have such a broad level of participation across the industry in this study. So we're going to walk through um, the report. First, we're going to look at what kind of risks are faced in the construction industry, how big of an impact they have, and what are the high-risk areas. Then we're going to look at how the best methods for evaluating and mitigating construction risk. We're going to look at a couple of triggers and obstacles for increasing the use of risk management practices in the industry. We're going to look at strategies for reducing risk, and this is where I'll bring in maybe a few other studies that we've conducted as well, and then summarize with some quick conclusions. So first, um, you know, the first one of the questions that we asked is we wanted to establish to what degree risk is a problem in the industry. And the first step was to see how commonly owners, GCs, and trades experienced a dispute or claim in the last five years. As you can see from these pie charts, it was very common, in particular for GCs, with 83% reporting that they had experienced a dispute or claim. Clearly, risk is something that needs to be managed in the construction industry. Um, now, even and even the lowest, the trade contractors, at 60%, you know, we st it's still a significant amount who are struggling with this issue. So. Once we established that this is a big problem, we wanted to know what are the disputes or claims with the biggest impact. And we looked at this question from two angles. First, how frequently did uh, people experience a dispute or claim, these particular types of disputes and claims? Were they, you know, were they common or were they very uncommon? The second question is we asked them to rank them in terms of which were the most costly of the disputes or claims categories that they saw. And what you'll see, and you'll see this throughout the study, is that owners experience things very differently from contractors. And in this particular case, GC and trade contractors have a very different experience as well. So when it comes to owners, you can see that by far the disputes and claims with the greatest impact are those arising from construction defects. They are not only the most frequent, but they are the most expensive as well for owners by a large margin. Uh, the only other thing that really kind of pops out is warranty issues, which were selected by 25% as the most frequent uh, problems that they experience. When it comes to general contractors, um, GCs by far rank subcontractor default termination or failure first as the most frequent uh, disputes and claims that they experience and the most costly. And really, with nearly half saying this, with nearly half ranking it first, it's a clear um, issue for GCs, the biggest issue of all. The only other one of note in this case is slightly more than a quarter also find that claims arising from construction defects are the most costly. And then finally, we have the trade contractors. And as you can see, uh, things are a little bit less definitive. Certainly, they frequently experience warranty issues. It's a common issue for them. But it's no more, it's not ranked first as costly any more frequently than claims arising from construction defects. And, you know, and a quarter also say that that happens relatively frequently. So these are also um, issues. That they need um, that, that that they need to address. Now, in addition to our study, the AGC also conducted a study last year on risk. They had a slightly different focus, um, but their findings really did correspond to ours in very interesting ways. And um, one of the focuses they had was to look at risk specifically in terms of what kind of post-recession risk contractors were facing. And they determined that there were three major post-recession risks. The shortage of skilled labor, owners transferring risk to contractors, and subcontractor default. 
And I wanted to touch on those because um, they are very interesting and we have some interesting data on them in the report. First, we also looked at just a very broad question. Uh, we asked the participants in the study whether they thought that labor scarcity right now increases their risk on projects. And you can see that 81% agree that it increases their risk, with over a third saying that they strongly agree. And that little light yellow um, wedge is those who disagree. It's a combination of those who disagree and strongly disagree. And you can see it's a very, very minor percentage. There's a lot of the industry really feels like risk is increased right now by labor scarcity. Now, in addition to doing this broad survey that I discussed, that we had all the partners on, we did a very small set of in-depth interviews with three surety experts that are featured in the report. And some of these, these people from the major sureties, they really had some great insights on how to deal with these workforce risks. And one pointed out that shortages are very likely to continue, that you know, they're expecting shortages to stay the same for the next three years, and that they could, after, that point, after that, they could actually get worse. And the ways that they recommend that contractors help mitigate those kind of workforce risks, they had three major recommendations. The first was to be more selective about projects pursued, focusing on profitability rather than growth. And, you know, we're seeing some data that suggests that profitability is a bigger issue right now for contractors than growth. Uh, you, can also, you, you can see that they also recommended that the, the contractors need to be instituting their own training programs. They can't rely on associations and other educational systems. If they want a skilled workforce, they may have to create their own skilled workforce. And then finally, uh, the key tip that they had was leveraging technology and lean techniques. And I'm not going to talk about that much now because we're going to do a much tighter focus on that towards the end of this presentation. All right, so that was the big risk of a lack of workforce that um, the, the AGC study pointed out as a post-recession risk. Uh, the second big post-recession risk was the owner shifting new risk to contractors. Uh, that also came up a lot in our study. We'll be touching on it again in multiple points. But again, I wanted to, to, to share some insights with you that we got from those in-depth interviews with the surety experts. First of all, we, they, they really point out that there's an increase in um, owners wanting one single source of res responsibility, that they don't want five different sources of, of responsibility. They just want one that they can go to. And the other interesting insight from this is that uh, this may actually present a competitive opportunity. If contractors can embrace and figure out how to manage these new risks, it gives them an advantage. And you know, that type of risk favors the more sophisticated contractors. They will ultimately prevail because they are better managers of risk. Now, finally, the third issue that came up in the AGC study as a specific post-recession risk is managing subcontractor defaults. And um, here, we, all, we actually had a feature article in the Smart Market Report that focused on this issue of subcontractor default risks and what the industry can do. And uh, Jim Bly from Alliant contributed to that piece, and he points out that subcontractor default can be a bigger risk than people even credit it for being. He said a critical path subcontractor could be relatively small but have a large impact on the overall schedule. The loss on that subcontractor could end up being four to six times the subcontract value. So, you know, it, again, it's that idea that you really have to recognize the severity of this type of risk. And the article features three key ways to mitigate this particular risk. The first one is to develop a robust pre-qualification and monitoring of subcontractors. The surety experts as well noted that people tend to keep working with the same people and they don't always do a thorough examination of their risk. 
Um, the second is there, to actually invest in subcontractor default insurance. And the third is performance bonds for subcontractors holding very large contracts. So nowadays on some of these projects, the large MEP contracts can be, uh, you know, 40% of the project overall cost. So, you know, getting a performance bond in that situation is critical. So back to our study, in addition to saying, okay, what claims and disputes did um, they, did, did they face? We also looked at, well, what do they consider to be the biggest risk factors? And again, and you're going to hear me say this over and over over the course of the next hour, there were major differences with the way owners viewed these risks versus the way contractors viewed these risks. We looked at them in four major categories. We asked them about several strategic risks, several operational risks, several financial risks, and several hazards. And we asked the respondents to rank each risk on a scale of one to five, with one being no risk and five being a very high risk. The series of bar charts that you're going to see is going to be the percentage of all of these respondents who ranked everything either a four or a five. So these are the things that people felt that were, belong in a high risk category. So you can see that when it comes to strategic high-risk factors, that for owners, not that many rank them that high. That uh, there's just you know brand reputation risk and contractual specification risk are, le are ranked in that four or five category by by less than 20 percent. However, over a quarter of the uh, contractors do consider contractual specification of risk a top very high risk factor. And again, that goes right back to the, uh, the fact that contractors are being asked to take on a lot more risk in their contracts than they have traditionally. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the slide for each of these, I'm not really going to go through these, but you can see that it does show you that these were not the only things we asked about, that, that, these were so, that, that the other items were here, but they were selected as high risk by 10% or less of any of the respondents. So um, you know, we, I won't be covering those specifically, but just so you get a sense of everything that was asked. All right, so the second category of risks is operational risks. And immediately you can see that these are the key risks for owners. These are the things that worry owners the most, that about a quarter of the owners say that planning scope changes, cost escalation, and schedule changes are very high risk items for them. For GCs, labor procurement and subcontract management is tops. Um, but they also have, are, you know, at least a quarter of them also consider schedule changes to be a high risk area. And then the trades are more evenly split between those two, between schedule changes and labor procurement risks. When it comes to financial factors, again, these affect contractors far more strongly than, than owners. They're far more worried about them. Um, and it's another type of contractual risk than the one we talked about previously. You can see it refers to things like warranty, guarantees, owners of plans and specs, uh, project specs, things like that. Those kind of contractual risks, very important to GCs and trade contractors. Delays in payment and claims, um, again, a particularly high risk for trade contractors. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the last category is the hazards category. And I do want to point out that none of these were selected by even 18%, to say nothing of 20%, as, the, as high risk. None of them were rated a 4 or a 5 on that scale of 1 to 5 that we talked about. So at this point, contractors, they're not, they're, they, they, some consider these notable, but in general, um, contractors and owners are not really putting a lot of weight and emphasis on hazard risks. All right, so that was just a quick summary by category. Before we move on from this, I thought it would be useful to present you with the, the top three risks by players. If you look across all the categories, since they were rating them all on a scale of one to five, you can compare outside of the categories in which they were asked. And you can see that for owners, again, it's just the operational risks. It's those planning scope changes, the schedule changes, and the cost escalations that are the top risks. For GCs, 
labor procurement and subcontract management is by far the top risk. Um, then when you get to the other two, these they share with the trade contractors. Contractual specification of risk and schedule changes are considered very important by both types of contractors. Uh, for trades, delays in payment and claims, it makes sense. If you're the last one in the line to get paid, you're going to have the one who's got the most concern about that. So that kind of covers the risks that they're facing out there in the industry. So now the next question is, well, what can you do about it? And we actually conducted a risk study um, several years ago, back in 2012. And we looked at a series of risk evaluation and mitigation strategies. And we returned to those again in this study. Now, we didn't look at them the same way. Last time, we were really just interested in, well, does, does, does engaging in these help you save money? But we realized that risk has a lot more impact on a project than just that one bottom line item. That while that is critical and certainly something we tried to cover in this study, that there's a lot of other ways that risk um, impacts people's businesses. So we, we, we expanded our focus on these considerably. But the first question is, of course, just on use. How many um, owners and contractors are actually using these methods. And we're going to look at risk evaluation strategies first, and then we're going to look at risk mitigation strategies. So we asked about these four that you see listed. You can see that they're all in pretty wide use. Certainly formal brainstorming with the team is commonly used as our checklists and forms and risk registers, but two-thirds are also do, uh, seeking expert input from internal resources, and about half are looking for expert input from external resources. So it's, it's helpful to know what they're doing, but what's really even more important is what's effective. And so we took everyone who said, you know, I'm using this, this, and this, and we said, all right, now take the ones that you, you use and rank them, you know, up first, second, and third. And yeah, obviously they could rank up to three. If, they did, if they're using something but didn't consider it particularly effective, they didn't have to include it in the ranking. So uh, the percentage of those who are using these strategies and who rank them in their top three are listed in the bright blue boxes. And you can see that by far the most effective strategy is formal brainstorming with team, with the entire project team. That is by far, you know, much, many percentage points higher than any of the others. And, you know, so it's not just commonly used, it's really considered effective. What's interesting is that the second most effective is not the second most frequently used. It's that expert input from internal resources. And you can see that the top benefits by player um, are reported for these. Um, so, and, you know, after we determined, okay, these are what you consider the most effective, we then said, okay, you think these are so effective, what benefits are you seeing when you use them? And we gave everyone a list of nine possible benefits to select from. And I, I want to point that out because with the, for many of the next few slides, you're going to see a lot of the same benefits over and over again. It was clear and that the same benefits typically emerged from a lot of what people were doing. So, um, but different, but it's still, you also can see that owners, GCs, and trades are experiencing different benefits based on what they're doing. So I'm, just, I'm not going to go through all of them with you, but I am going to go through the, through the top two most effective. So first, you know, you can see the top benefits of formal brainstorming by players. You can see that owners most typically said that increased reliability and overall project performance is their top benefit. <coughs> and GCs share that opinion of formal brainstorming. So and those are most common. And trades also consider that pretty, a, a pretty high-ranking benefit of formal brainstorming. In addition to that, brainstorming clearly impacts construction cost, um, according to owners and trades. 
It impacts schedule, according to owners and GCs, and it impacts safety, according to owners and trades. So you can see that this already has a lot of dividends in critical areas, cost, schedule, reliability, and safety, pretty much a lot of the measures that a lot of owners use to gauge the quality of their projects. And when it comes to the top benefits of internal um, expert input by player. Again, that increased reliability and overall project performance is a top, top finding. Everyone finds that if they're bringing in their internal experts, that they are getting more reliability. In addition to that, you can see that owners and trades find um, that, that it reduces construction costs. GCs and trades find that it improves project safety. And it's associated with quality by the owners innovation by the GCs, and improved client satisfaction by the trades. There is also, but there's a really interesting question of when they're using these tools as well. Um, and one thing that came out that we did ask that of every tool, we said at what stage are you using these? And they were allowed to select multiple stages. So that they're, they, you know, they could be using them during design and during bidding and during construction. They would select all three, and this chart would represent all of that. But what you can see is that both of these, despite being strongly collaborative and real ways of figuring out and evaluating risk, they still see a strong peak during the construction phase, especially among GCs and trades. And this is not always the most effective way to use these. In some ways, this, this finding suggests a real area for growth. And you, know, you can see that they kind of, especially with the expert input from external resources in this case, you can see that you know, there's a few that seek it out in um, the pre-bidding stages. But then it, there's, it, it goes the huge spike during construction when things start to go wrong. So uh, you know, the, the, the better idea would be to get ahead of things. Okay, so that was our evaluation strategies. We asked about four of those. We asked about six mitigation strategies. And again, first we wanted to find out how many were using them. You can see from this chart that it is far less common for everyone to use all of the mitigation strategies. Only three out of six were used by more than half. And uh, the highest percentage of those using them, which was regular team meetings, uh, regular meetings of the full project team on risk, um, were used by two thirds. So a little bit less than the evaluation. Um, and you can see that there are some that are used by a third or less, including uh, risk prioritization and uh, use of special teams to evaluate risk and tracking risk metrics across projects. So which ones are the most effective according to those who are used them? You can see how many are ranking them first for effectiveness if they use them. And clearly, regular team meetings on risk is the most effective. Now, I do want to point out that this informal brainstorming were by far considered vastly superior to other things. They are also the two most collaborative strategies that we included in this survey. So you can see that there is already an emphasis on being able to collaborate, helping to reduce risk. Um, the, the one that seems the most underutilized at this point appears to be risk prioritization, where the ratio between those who find it effective and those who use it, rank it first for effectiveness and those who use it, is a little bit um, higher than, in other, than, than the other ones. So what are the top benefits of these? Again, you know, what did, when we asked about them, um, you know, what did they rank as the top benefits they were receiving from using these? And uh, we're going to, again, look at the top two most effective. So we're going to look first at these regular meetings of the full project team that are focused on risk. So owners, GCs, and trades all find, again, that it, in, it, it increases reliability. That is a consistent finding. Owners and GCs find it improves project schedule. 
GCs and trades find it improves safety. And a high percentage also rank it first for helping to maintain the original intent of the pro uh, this is among the owners of, uh, for project quality. And for owners, that is a particularly critical benefit. So the other one that the second most effective was the use of uh, planning for risk management, a risk management plan. And again, we see that the increased reliability very common. Improved safety for contractors. The, having a risk management plan really seems to have a big impact on safety, according to the contractors. And owners and GCs also agree this is a key strategy to improve schedule. So now that is one way to look at the benefits, right? We'll look by player, what, where are they getting the most benefits? However, we also did a little analysis with the data where we flipped. We had the same findings, but we flipped the result. And we said, okay, what if you want to increase reliability in your overall project performance? What are people finding to be the best ways to do that? And uh, you know, we, 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 we broke out the results between owners and contractors because sometimes there was a bit of a difference. There's also, though, a lot of overlap, and especially on this one. To increase reliability, you can see that getting that expert input from internal resources and especially conducting regular meetings of the full project team focused on risk are clearly the most effective ways to increase reliability. Owners also thought that they saw reliability really increase from formal brainstorming with the team. And contractors thought developing a plan to manage risk had a big impact on this particular benefit. Again, you know, another critical benefit on a project is reducing the cost of construction. So again, let's look at exactly which methods were considered the strongest. Uh, when it comes to owners, they want that expert input, not just from internal resources, but from external resources. And again, for them, formal brainstorming is key. Contractors agree formal brainstorming is key, but as with many of the other options, they really see great, great value in developing a plan to manage risk and especially in conducting regular meetings to, to, uh, to deal with risk with the full project team. And finally, what are the best ways to improve schedule? Well, interestingly here, contingency planning appears to be something that both owners and contractors find very, very valuable for improving project schedule. Owners are still looking for that expert input, and you'll see that with owners there's a lot of uncertainty about dealing with risk in a large way that we'll get to in the uh, triggers and obstacles too. Um, and they, they, they also think that just having checklist forms and risk registers really help with improved schedule. Contractors put their focus, again, on formal brainstorming. They think, you know, if they can get everybody in and brainstorming early on, that has a big impact. And again, keeping those regular meetings is almost always critical to them. And you can see that, again, I remember we asked about, you know, we, we asked, we had, um, 10 different options, yet the same three or four keep showing up, which really emphasizes their importance for improving safety, for maintaining the original intent for project quality, and for reducing rework. Okay, so now that we've looked at the risks faced by the contractors, and we've looked at how to evaluate and mitigate those risks and achieve critical benefits, let's take a look at what will encourage the industry to, de to, to devote more resources to risk management. And we asked people what were the top triggers. You know, we gave them a long list of possible things that would increase their use of risk management. Now, you can see that uh, for owners, the use of delivery systems that encourage team integration is by far the most important trigger. You know, the difference is that it was ranked first by 58% as opposed to 36% for the next category. Um, for, and that is also pretty important amongst the contractors as well. It is still ranks pretty high in the top three. However, when you look at what really matters to the contractors, what's really the strongest differential when looking at all of these different triggers, it's, again, that same finding, that notion that, that, that suddenly they're facing new risks that are built into their contracts that they haven't had to face before. This is the biggest trigger right now for them to invest in greater use of risk management. 
In addition to that, um, you can see that for GCs, concerns about trade contractor uh, default is also something that's really driving them to make this kind of investment. And for trade contractors, greater availability of risk management tools. Um, they, they want these, these practical ways. And you'll notice that both of those are, are they're pretty tactical, right? I mean, these are really just, you know, here's the risks we're facing. Here's tools to deal with them. This is what's increasing our use of risk management. When you look at what's ma what matters to the owners once you get past the use of the delivery system, what matters to them is just understanding the risks that they're facing better. They're looking for greater transparency on high-value projects, and they're looking for more widely available information on successful risk strategies. They want to understand what works and what's going on and what they're facing. To them, that's the biggest driver for the use of risk management practices. All right, so that's what's driving investment. What's preventing people from really engaging and, and, uh, and you know, devoting more resources to risk management? Again, with the owners, it's very similar. It's these big, broad categories about lack of knowledge, about risk mitigation strategies, lack of awareness of the cost of risk. And they also want to be guided more by the industry. They want there to be industry standards for evaluating and managing risk. These are the obstacles that, that, that prevent them from really doing the kind of risk management investment that, that they could be doing. For contractors, it's clear that it's about the lack of collaboration and cooperation, that they are worried about not um, having good enough information flowing between the design team and them, and between the, um, their client firms in them. They really want to, to they, they, they feel like they need better communication all the way through. Again, this notion of collaboration, integration, communication is central to risk management and keeps coming out again and again in this study. They also feel like greater competition among bidders, um, that, that sense that they're constantly being forced to bid things with very narrow margins, with uh, very tight schedules. This is also, for them, something that prevents them from doing the kind of risk um, mitigation and management that they'd like to be doing. All right, so now that we know what the high risk factors are, we've looked at some strategies for evaluating and mitigating risk and what would help or hinder the construction industry from investing more in risk management. Let's take a look at uh, the data from the study, but also some data that we have from other studies that we've conducted recently that really suggest some important trends in the industry that can help to reduce risk. Uh, now, the first pie chart here is from this study still. Um, towards the end, we did just ask all of the participants straight out, whether they agreed with the statement that increased collaboration with other members of the project team reduces risk. And you can see it's pretty much unanimous. Almost everyone agrees, yes, we need increased collaboration. And that just sounds so nice and easy and simple, doesn't it? But in fact, our studies have real, uh, have, we've done other studies that demonstrate what a challenge that is, why the industry is struggling with it. Now, of course, some of it has to do with the way contracts are set up. And uh, you know, I, that is a key part of it. But it's also in the culture. It's also baked into the culture. And I want to go through some findings from our um, managing uncertainty a report that we brought out a couple of years ago that really demonstrate the challenge that's in the industry right now about being able to work together effectively, collaboratively, in an integrated way. So um, that study looked at the causes of uncertainty, clearly, clearly related to risk. And we it, it determined that there were seven top causes of uncertainty. And it asked the participants in that study, in this case owners, architects, and contractors, to, to rank them, to, to evaluate how serious these are in terms of creating uncertainty on their projects. And they kind of landed up falling into well, these top seven landed up falling into four major buckets. The first one, which is just this one item, unforeseen site or construction issues, well, no one really owns that, right? I mean, things can come up that you just can't anticipate. Things happen, and, you know, that is a huge part of uncertainty, and you can see that it's ranked pretty highly by everyone. But where it gets more interesting 
is when you start getting into the causes of uncertainty that really kind of fall under the control of one of the three players. So for instance, two of the important causes of uncertainty are design errors and design emissions. But what you find out is when you have owners, architects, and contractors, right, how important these are in creating uncertainty on projects, you can see that owners think they're very important. Contractors think design emissions are very, very important. But architects really do not consider design errors or emissions a key of, uh, of key importance in terms of creating uncertainty on projects. But architects are not the only ones. Uh, when it comes to the things that were con are controlled by contractors, such as construction coordination issues and contractor cause delays, contractors are less likely to rank these seriously than our owners and architects. And not surprisingly, when we get to the owners, they're in the same pattern. That the things that they understand and control, they do not see as contributing to risk as much as the, as the other players do. So owner-driven changes in accelerated schedules, most owners don't think this is really a really key critical contributor to risk. So the point of this is that there is embedded in the culture some challenges. Challenges is why early collaboration and team integration are so important. It's too easy in the current mindset to assume that problems are the result of other team members. And this is a really big challenge to overcome. But it's ultimately really essential if you're going to reduce all of these causes of uncertainty and reduce risk. Every player has to recognize the, how important they are in contributing to uncertainty. And on the subject of collaboration, we also looked at BIM because, of course, you know, building information modeling has a lot of benefits. It certainly has things that, um, you know, with the clash detection, other things that, that clearly contribute to reducing risk on projects. But most of it, all of the studies we've done on BIM have demonstrated that it's the way in which it's helping to transform the process of construction to be more collaborative right from the design phase, to incorporate the insights across the project team, that BIM really adds value to projects. So when we see that building information modeling is reducing risk, it is about the use of the tool, but it's also, again, about that bigger transformation that's going on. Then finally, um, we, uh, the, we asked about the impact of lean construction on risk. And you can see that in this particular study, there was a pretty low percentage, only 39% who agreed that lean design and construction reduces risk. I think there's still a lot of um, confusion about lean in the industry. It has a lot of challenging terminology. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a sense in which it's, it's this long, elaborate process. But um, a lot of our work has really demonstrated its value. And I want to go into one study we conducted in 2016 that really demonstrates why, if you're talking about risk and managing it, why lean and some of the things behind it should probably be part of that conversation. So in partnership with the Lean Construction Institute, we did a survey of owners of building projects. And this survey asked the owners to consider two specific projects that they had worked on recently. One that they felt was pretty typical of their projects in general, and one that they felt really was a best project in terms of performance. Now, the chart you can see in front of you demonstrates that gap, right? What, you know, when we're talking about the difference between what you think a typical project is and what you think a best project is, what's the gap there? What, what does the industry, you know, what is the industry normally doing and what can it do? And you can see that the results are pretty extraordinary. On best projects, 24% were completing ahead of schedule. But on typical projects, 61% report that their typical projects are completed behind schedule. That's extraordinary. This means that it's pretty much common practice. This isn't best versus worst. This is best versus typical. 
So this means that for a lot of owners, there's just sort of a built-in expectation that their projects are going to complete behind schedule. And you can see that, um, you know, that 46% reported that their best projects actually were completed under, under budget, but 49% reported that their typical projects were completed over budget. Again, almost half say this is just sort of what normally happens. So clearly, there's room in the industry for improvement, and a lot of that has to do with risk management, right? Getting the budget under control, getting the schedule under control. Now, the study goes into a lot of different factors. Um, that, but in addition to saying, okay, well, what's the differences you're experiencing on your best versus typical projects? We then said, well, what are you doing on your best and typical projects? We wanted to find out what practices could possibly be correlated with better project outcomes. And it's interesting, um, there was a whole bunch of stuff, but one of the top findings really had to do with when on a project key stakeholders were engaged. Now, on, um, by key stakeholders, the study sp explicitly described them as, of course, you know, the design team and the general contractor, but also the top trades. So, you know, your MEP trades, structural steel, if there's, if it's steel on the project. Those critical trades were also included in key stakeholder engagement. And the results are really, really striking. You can see that on your best projects, 76% report that on their best projects, they were engaging key stakeholders during conceptualization when their 15% or less of design was complete. 76% are engaging that their key stakeholders as early as that on their best projects. On the other hand, on typical projects, 42% do not engage key stakeholders until design development or later. So clearly, the, the uh, idea of getting key stakeholders involved is correlated to this improved project performance. In addition to that, we also looked at some project management methods. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. Truthfully, I am no lean expert myself. I'm just the researcher. I'm not going to go into detail on things like A3 thinking. But I think it's pretty clear from this list. So that what you're looking at is uh, the, the orange part of the bar represents the percentage of those who said, yes, I use this on a typical project. And the blue part of the bar represents those who said, yes, I use this particular approach on my best performing projects. Well, look at the very first one, co-location big room. One of the biggest gaps, I think the biggest gap between best and typical, that it was very pretty, uh, nearly half say, yeah, we use co-location big room on our best projects. Almost no one is using them on their typical projects. So again, that notion of early collaboration, getting everyone involved, and, and, and getting out of that traditional mode of protecting just your own bottom line turns out to be critical in improving project performance. Um, other things include full team onboarding, a far higher percentage are doing it on their best project than typical project. Uh, last planner, which does involve some collaborative elements, also you can see a big gap. Uh, you know, other lean processes were also pretty important. Prefab and modularization turned out to be important. Use of BIM authoring turned out to be important. But really, the one key thing is, is that, that collaboration thing. If there's nothing else you walk away with, hopefully you walk away with that. So with that, let me just give you some quick conclusions from the study. Uh, first, it's just the obvious that you all already know going in, but that the study really supports, which is that disputes and claims take a large toll on the construction industry. The second is that owners are most concerned about operational risks, while contractors are concerned about shifting contractual risks, workforce issues, and defaults. Those are the key things that are really um, driving those two groups. Being able to handle risk effectively can be a competitive advantage in this era of shifting contractual risks as owners seek one source of accountability. And most importantly, 
that collaboration reduces risk, that the most effective means for evaluating and mitigating risk are collaborative, and that the use of delivery systems that encourage project team integration is selected as a top trigger by owners and contractors alike for the increased use of risk management practices. And of course, there's just you know, the fact that they all said being more collaborative helps to reduce risk. All right, so with that, um, I did want to point out that, you know, please feel free to visit construction.com uh, for any additional resources, but um, I also wanted to take a look and see if there's been any questions that have come up during the discussion. So I'm sorry, I'm just, I just am just looking at these now, so you'll have to forgive me if I have a little pause as I read. So uh, the first question that came up asked how the study was focused. And I'm hoping, I know that came up, popped up pretty early in the discussion because they were curious about how the study addresses the risk of an owner as the most skin in the game in the construction process. And you can see that the study does address that owners experience risk very, very differently from contractors and that they understand it and they approach it differently. Um, did, another question said, did trade contractors have the opportunity to note late or non-payment as a risk? And that was that question of, of payment. Um, and in the early part when they were looking at the high-risk strategies, um, you could see that trade contractors were far more concerned during, in the financial risks than any other player about um, delays in payments and claims. That, that delays in payment was the main way that co trade contractors had the opportunity to note this as a risk. And like I said, one quarter of them selected it as a high risk, rated it as a very high risk to them. Um, now, the question, one of the questions said, are there any specific types of skilled labor that are more of concern, such as lack of, such as lack of welders, carpenters, electricians, et cetera? Um, we did not get into that kind of detail in this study. Um, we are engaging in other studies right now that are looking at this issue, but um, we won't be reporting on those publicly for a few more months. But I would almost say just keep your eyes on this space because I, I'm not at liberty right now to reveal initial findings, unfortunately. But that is an issue that we're actively looking at and that we plan to, uh, to, to, to report on coming up in the future. Um, now, another question was also about this uh, question of skilled workers. Is there any evidence that lack of skilled workers is already causing claims, especially delay claims? Um, there, I have not heard anything beyond anecdotal discussion of this, so we did not, again, delve into that issue specifically relating to skilled workers and trades. I imagine that there are resources out there that have looked at that question a little bit more thoroughly. I apologize that I... I, but I don't have more data on that, but I think that's a great question. And I certainly think that there is something to be said for a study. I, we would love to be able to take this a step further. Given how important skilled worker risks are right now, we would love to do additional work, additional studies on this and, and, and examine that issue because I think, I think it would be interesting to find out. Now, there's a question about to what extent can GCs reduce the risk of subcontractor failure by gathering better information about the reputation of local subcontractors and their performance reputation. And that is um, one of the points that definitely came up with the uh, surety experts that we interviewed. That was one of the key ways that they said to avoid defaults and other risks, that, that, you know, that contractors need to take very seriously vetting subcontractors, especially those that they're not familiar with. But they also pointed out that, you know, you, that, that knowing what other types of projects any subcontractor you're working with is working on in the next, you know, alongside yours is pretty important. You need to understand the additional demands on their time. So it isn't even necessarily just about their reputation 
but it's about really knowing what, how much risk they're adding to your project. They could be a great firm, but a great firm that's overextended is still going to have challenges. So, um, now it's interesting. So, um, so one person volunteered a few of the biggest risks for, in construction for owners that they are seeing um, in their world. They list terrorism as number one. They list cyber liability to systems and business interruption as number two. Drugs in the workplace as number three. But I, want to, I do want to let you know <coughs> that we recognize that cyber liability is a big issue. We didn't include it formally in the study because there isn't that much going on in the industry right now. We think to, you know, you, it, would, it would get lost. It would, it would have such low performance numbers that we wouldn't land up performing on it anyway. So instead of including it as a point in the study, we actually did include a two-page feature article on what contractors need to be thinking about in terms of cyber risk. This includes everything from the fact that when they're involved in, say, large utility projects, things like that, their own cyber vulnerabilities become a cyber vulnerability for the entire project and could put major infrastructure assets at risk. It looked at that. But it also looked at, well, where are the points of weakness? What do contractors need to be paying attention to? How can they start thinking about cyber risk? And I do recommend taking a look at the report and looking at the recommendations in that because I think that while this a particular point that this person was making was specifically focused on um, owners, I think that that's, that's this question of cyber liability and cyber risk is one that's, that's shared across the industry, that the construction industry is certainly not immune. And, you know, another area that the construction industry really needs to be very conscious of with this is, you know, there's a lot of movement towards the Internet of Things in the construction industry and the, the value that you can get from tagging things, from increasing sensors, from all of this. But as attacks even that have been conducted in the last year have shown, the Internet of Things is also a risk. So, you know, people, the, 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 the things are changing so fast in technology and there's so many new capabilities that it can be very challenging. So it is something that those who are taking their risk profile seriously need to consider. Oh, and I do want to answer one question. Um, that expert input is um, the the owl thing was that was that was purely a coincidence. That even though Ermi was involved in the study, we did not know we didn't get their logo <laughs> until relatively late in the process, and we did not mean to imply that Ermi is uh, the uh, the expert input. They are a fantastic organization. They were an incredibly valuable partner in the study, but the, our use of the owl is just because owls are traditionally associated with you know expertise and wisdom. It had you know we chose it for the same reason that Ermi did, but it was not a direct reference to Ermi, and I apologize if that is if there's any kind, of any kind of confusion there. So uh, full team onboarding, there was a question about what that is. That is exactly what it sounds like. It's bringing the team in early, not bringing in individual sections of the team as you know, the project proceeds along in the traditional manner, but onboarding everyone so that you're getting the insights from all of the key team members very early on. Um, what types of owners were involved? That might be a question that I will need to respond to offline. We, uh, we did have a large number of responses, and um, I don't know exactly, but I know we, had a, we did have a mix of public and private. Um, I don't know the degree to which they were in higher ed or high tech, though, uh, in reference to the question that was asked. And there was a question about my email address. Um, I would be happy to pro uh, provide that, uh, but my name is a little long. So it's Donna, D-O-N-N-A dot Laquidera, at, at, which is L-A-Q-U-I-D-A-R-A -A -A, at construction.com. Um, you know, if you have the invitation that lists my name in the invite, uh, my, uh, my name is hyphenated with the car. My official name is Donna Laquidera Carr, but that's not included in my email address. It just includes the Laquidera. 
So um, again, everything I've talked about, uh, including you know some mention of, of what was covered in that um, that. Uh, that, that report from AGC is in our Smart Market Report. And I do want to end by, uh, by emphasizing again that report is available for free download. Uh, you can go to uh, analyticsstore.construction.com to get it. Or those of you who all go to construction.com, there's a resources tab, and it's available for download there as well. So uh, multiple ways you can get your hands on this report. Um, I, I hope you all take advantage of it, and I think we are at 3 o'clock. We are at our time. But thank you very much for participating in this and for the interesting questions. Um, I will try to get back to the ones I wasn't able to address here. And um, again, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>